Welcome everybody uh, to this webinar today. You are uh, in the presence of some amazing facilitators who will be sharing their experience delivering the resilience uh, and thriving or sometimes called resilience to thriving curriculum. Sometimes it's called the secret power of stress, S-E-C-R-E-T, stress, evaluate, cope, resilience, evolve, thrive. I'm going to show my slides. My name is Joel Bennett. So today um, is January 18th, 2024. This is the training uh, Resilience to Thrive, Thriving, and we're talking about meeting successful trainers. Here are our presenters for today, and you can see them also on the screen, and each one will speak in turn. Unfortunately, Stephanie may not be able to make it, but we will still be able to share her information with you in the slide deck. And everyone who's here today should be re receiving a copy of today's slide deck. So a little bit of background on what this uh, is all about. Resilience and Thriving is an evidence-based program that's taught in classroom style. We've also have uh, shared it virtually. Uh, there are many objectives, but the primary objective is to provide participants, both as individuals and groups, and this is most often taught to intact work groups uh, or other association groups, tools for transforming stress into a positive resource. So it's a stress transformation tool. We utilize cognitive behavioral principles, a workbook, self-assessments, group discussion, and a five-step guided cognitive visualization process. While this is an evidence-based program that has core fidelity, it's a highly adaptive program, as you will see. And facilitators uh, use a variety of different methods to get the same core message across that you can make stress your friend and also transform it. Uh, part of the reason it's adaptive is that our book, Raw Coping Power, has over 30 tools within it that can be uh, shaped to the facilitator's needs. In addition, facilitators adapt the program as to length and size of uh, group. Ideally, we ask that it be delivered with a minimum of 90 minutes. Uh, the ideal group size is between 12 and 20, although uh, I know some facilitators have delivered this to 150 people at a time. Um, and so far, we've have over 1,500 facilitators trained to date in this model. <clears throat> the training itself has four sections. There's an orientation. Uh, there's a, a whole section on understanding what stress is and that it's not just about fight, flight, and freeze, but also we talk about the seven Fs of stress, which is forage, friend, figure out, and flourish. We talk about the positive coping cycle and the negative or addictive coping cycle. The funding that uh, is behind this research was from National Institutes of Health because there was an interest in uh, preventing uh, addiction in uh, adult workers. So we make a, we emphasize the importance of choosing healthy alternatives compared to addictive uh, processes. And as you can see here, there's a personal workbook. <clears throat> we do take some time to focus on cultural factors as drivers of employees feeling separated, uh, being treated as consumers only, and the addiction associated with that. So the message here is that stress is not your fault. Key outcomes, and we can share research with you. In fact, uh, we are coming out with a paper this year that shows that some of our facilitators are actually better than me when it comes to delivering the program. And there are some people here who, if not all of you, who I can share that data with. But key outcomes include understanding and addressing stress warning signs, correcting unhealthy stress responses, enhancing Again, healthy alternatives to coping and adapting an ongoing healthy lifestyle that helps to transform stress. In fact, that's the area where facilitators, many who have a wellness background, uh, do very well 
in terms of being able to convey that you can change your lifestyle so that you don't experience as much stress. Just so you know, uh, at the end of this, you'll, we'll talk about upcoming opportunities. The next uh, one that's coming up pretty quickly here to become a certified facilitator, uh, be, the pre-work begins January 31st. So with that, I just want to say that uh, as you're listening today, please enter all questions in the chat box. Please be respectful and we will answer all questions at the end. Let's start with our first speaker, uh, Dan. I think I've got it. You're good to go. All right. Hello and welcome. Thank you for the uh, introduction, Joel. I'm Dan, Dan Jolve. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. And if you I'm going to rush through because I know we only have a few minutes uh, each. So uh, if you'll move. So I actually met Joel at a con conference five years ago now almost. Uh, I had been looking for uh, evidence-based research supported wellness. Uh, I work in a disability insurance company. We provide services to people either who have just gone out on disability leave or who are at risk of going on disability leave. And I had been talking about the need for better preventive services. And so I, you know, was looking around. I've worked in health insurance. I've been in uh, healthcare for 40, coming up on 44 years now, and uh, worked in health insurance. Uh, I was a, a clinical psychologist for 22 years. Uh, and uh, one of the things I had learned in my work in health insurance and disability insurance is they're really was almost nothing in terms of uh, evidence-based research supported uh, wellness or well-being efforts. And when Joel and I first talked, it was it was like, wait, you have you have developed something that actually has research supporting it. Uh, and so I got trained. We started offering it to uh, our customers. Uh, our brokers, customers, meaning people who have bought our disability insurance, but also insurance brokers and consultants. Uh, I've offered it to HR folks. I've offered it internally to our employees. Uh, you know, the main reason uh, from the company's perspective for me to do this is to increase brand awareness. Uh, for me, it's really about increasing wellness. Um, I'm acutely aware of the United States being on a negative trajectory when it comes to mental health, uh, substance use, and overall wellness. So the way I've done it, we offer it free. My employer pays for me to uh, to for my time to do it, uh, and I've offered it to anyone who's interested. Um, you know, so we've had groups that aren't customers uh, say, "Hey, would you do this?" And I convince uh, have convinced my uh, employer that it's beneficial for us to do this because then they'll know about the standard. We don't have much brand awareness, um, but also I just think it's good to train people. Um, I only, uh, I've only done the training with employed adults. Um, and I have adapted the uh, program to rearrange the slides. I've added a joke. I've added a, a picture of a cute dog to sort of break it up. I always ask for at least 90 minutes. Um, and I think I'm a bit above, above 475 uh, people having participated so far with another uh, session coming up in like two, three weeks. So if you go to the next slide, uh, the, the thing I wanted most was to be able to give people tools that they could use and that would help them in their ongoing life. I have lots of positive comments. I liked this one. I just poked, picked this one because I liked where they said not only did they start believing resilience and thriving might be attainable, but that they're not at the uh, mercy of outside forces tearing them down. And uh, the the 
best feedback I've gotten. I've had a number of people tell me afterwards, hey, I've, I'm using this with my spouse. I've taught my spouse how to do this. I'm using this with my kids. Several people have told me they've taught their kids. And I think, you know, we do a terrible job of teaching our kids how to deal with stress. And I, I wish we all learned these skills. Um, every comment, I've never had anyone make a negative comment other than that it can seem rushed, there's too much information. And if you go to the next uh, slide, you'll see the biggest barrier. Uh, oh, well, I put, I, I, yeah, put that yeah. in there for you. Go ahead. Yep. The biggest barrier has been getting uh, time commitments from groups. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of employers who say, oh, we desperately need something. Can we, you know, can you give us anything? And I say, yes, I've got this. It's great. It's got evidence and, and research supporting it. it. Takes 90 minutes and they're like, oh, can you do it in 20? Can you do it in half an hour? <laughs> Occasionally, they'll go all the way to saying an hour. And I'm, I, I've done it once in an hour, and it was like, yeah, it was just pointless to me. So this brings uh, to mind what I see as the the biggest barrier, not, not just to this, but to most wellness efforts in the workplace, which is that employers say, we really want to give our workers tools. We really want to support their well-being, but we don't want to give any time towards that. We can't afford. And sometimes it's true, like during the early stages of the pandemic, I had uh, hospital groups that said, we really, we don't have five minutes between uh, crises. Um, and so I did some work with the hospitals, giving them ideas about what to do in those five minutes to improve their wellness. But most of the time I've been, you know, it's like you want wellness, but you, you can't afford 90 minutes or even better, two hours. Um, and that to me is one of the central contradictions that I, I see we struggle with. So that's my thumbnail sketch. I think that was eight minutes, but I'm not sure. And let me pass it on to Jessica. Thanks, Dan. So hi, everybody. I'm so glad you guys could join us today to hear much more about what it is to be a resilience facilitator. I got trained in April, so it hasn't even been a year yet. And I work for St. Elizabeth Healthcare, which is in the Northern Kentucky region. I have a background in wellness by trade. I'm a certified athletic trainer, certified personal trainer, certified health coach, and mental health first aider. And just thought this would be something more to expand to our associates at St. Elizabeth in healthcare stress and burnout run rampant. So wanted to find a way to extend those opportunities to them. So next slide. So at St. Elizabeth, we have over 11,000 associates. And what I have done is I have created this as a three part series. So the first session I have with them is an hour. I find out in advance what the stressors for that particular department are facing. So it's very customized. I then come back 30 days after that and do a second series, which is around 30 minutes. And we just build upon what we learned in the first series, as well as digging a little deeper into those stressors that that department is facing. I then come back a month later and do the final part that is also about 30 minutes again, continuing to build on those skills and finding out what have they done over the course of the past two months when they've encountered difficulties, um, adverse events, and how are they dealing with those. So I primarily do these in person and they are by request only, but I do offer them virtually as well. I find it's not as effective, but it also depends on the teams that I'm working with. If they're a team that is really solid and has strong communication skills, then the virtual seems to work really well. I have done these two groups um, as large as 400 and as small as two. So I just uh, customize my presentation depending on the size of the audience and what that interaction is going to be. So far, I've done well over 70, probably closer to 80 or 90 since April. And then what I've also done 
Um, and this has reached uh, over a thousand people so far have gone through my, my courses. And then I am certified, of course, in the wellness department. I recently had the uh, additional wellness specialist certified, and then I brought on our entire EAP team. So they are internal. Our EAP is an internal uh, program. And so now all of them are certified as well. So there are seven of us within St. Elizabeth that are certified resilience and facility. Uh, I can't speak, resilience uh, facilitators. So this is a just a quick survey that I have the outcomes. This is only 507 um, responses, but you can see this is the pre and the post. So the questions are identical. So we do the, the pre-survey um, before I begin the presentation. And then at, at the conclusion, they do the post-survey. So you can see across the board, there's been an increase in everything um, when they get done with the training that they're feeling that they're much more equipped to better deal with stress and understand stress and, and how to cope in a really healthy way. So what I always uh, pull back to with all of my sessions is I, I lean on this, uh, this quote, a smooth sea never made for a skillful sailor. So I always bridge that letting them know if we don't face adverse events and difficulty, we can never learn and grow and build that resilience within ourselves. So for us, the barriers um, have been time to, a, to a, a small degree. You know, healthcare, it's really difficult to get departments to give uh, an hour of their time away off the floor or whatever their department might be. But they have seen this as a priority and this is supported from the top down, from our CEO down. So. Uh, all of our leadership knows that these uh, resilience workshops are going to help build the resilient uh, organization, and that's what our goal is. Beautiful, Jessica. Uh, for everyone who's joined us, um, please enter any questions you have in the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end of our session today. I believe, Julie, you're next. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everybody. I guess it's morning where everybody is, except unless you're on the East Coast. Um, so good afternoon to those of us on the East Coast. Glad to be here. My name is Julie Dostel. I am the Executive Director of the LEAF Council on Alcoholism and Addictions. We are in Oneonta, New York, which is central New York, very, very rural area of New York. And I am a prevention specialist. And so what I do is I work with my community and I work with my region to try to prevent a problem before it starts. So I work in the prevention of substance misuse. Next. So the way that we do this project and this program, we've been working with Joel in our area for a little over two years now to do a network approach to prevention. And as you see in that circle on the map, we work with 12 counties. I have eight prevention partners, wonderful prevention partners that I get to work with across the county, the, the 12 counties. We have 15 trainers that are trained to do this work. Two funding partners, which are which is the New York State OASAS, which is the Office of Addiction Services and Supports, as well as the Appalachian Regional Commission. And we do work very closely with the OWLS team to help us with our data collection. They got us trained in all of this and helped us get started. As you can see, that is a big swath of real estate where we cover 9,300 square mile, miles, which is larger than the state of Vermont. And we are busy. So far, we've done 31 businesses and we have provided this programming to 1,493 employees. Next slide. So prevention across the lifespan is the passion here. So the why is that it, prevention really matters for adults. If you think about prevention in our world, you know, when we talk about heart disease prevention, diabetes prevention, high blood pressure, pre pressure prevention, cancer prevention, we don't stop at 12th grade. We do prevention across the lifespan. And in the world of substance misuse prevention, Typically and historically, we kind of did it with elementary and high school students, as well as community groups and sometimes some information education. And that's what we did. Working with the adult workforce gave us an opportunity to do evidence based prevention with adults. And it was in, in my entire career in prevention. This is the first opportunity we've had to do evidence based prevention with adults. And so this matters. And now we can 
treat addiction and prevention of addiction, just like we treat diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, all of those things that we all work on our entire lives. It is no secret that the need is great and continues to grow. Our entire workforce took a hit with COVID and the hits keep on coming with um, uh, too many openings in businesses. Uh, we are talking about people struggling with economy, their finances, families, all of that. So that need just continues to grow. And we see that in our work that we're doing and the work that we roll out. And I want to just say right up front, for us to be able to do it on this scale, capacity building and relationship building was the key And that we sat down, we talked with people, we surveyed people, we did key informant interviews, we did focus groups to find out what businesses actually needed in rural central New York. And because we did that legwork ahead of time, we've really been able to make some very nice connections with businesses in New York. Our target is small businesses in rural upstate New York, and we have adapted this program and our adaptations have mainly looked like working with community groups to be able to introduce this project to the community so that then we can go into their businesses, as well as working with college students. And can I tell you, doing this work with college students is delightful. So we've enjoyed doing that. And the typical length of our training is two hours. We go in asking for two and a half. But if we get two, we smile about it. So that's kind of how we do this work. Next. Just want to let you know, we've seen some really great improvements on certain items from pre to post. It's amazing to see what can happen with pre to post. Just a sample is I know my own wor or, um, early warning signs for stress. We see that go from 62% when they walk in the door to 75% when they go out. That The end for this survey is 881. Um, and I am confident that I can recognize these signs before I experience too much stress. We see less than half of them knowing that answer or, or, or affirming that answer when they come in and more than two thirds when they walk out. So we're really grateful to see that the work that we're doing is making an improvement in as little as 90 minutes to two hours. Next. So some challenges and want to just kind of put these out there. My personal challenge is being present for every participant when life has so many distractions. Everything that we do in this work is about connection, and I want to be able to provide connection and hold space for people so that they can talk about possibly some tough stuff in their life. And as an executive director who is also a trainer, I often have many distractions. And so I have to be very intentional about being present for every participant. And when we have conversations, that I am present with them as we have those conversations in the groups. Organizationally, um, we're Working on a wide range of very busy stakeholders um, as prevention providers in New York, I am certainly not the only one who has a busy schedule. And so our trainers have a busy schedule. My peers who are executive directors have busy schedules. So working with a wide range of stakeholders who are just busy people. And finally, my appreciation for this project and for this program is genuine connection. Um, it's often said that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety necessarily. The opposite of addiction is connection. And I love to share this quote because we talk about sharing things with each other and, and having connection within the teams of people that we work with. And this is from my favorite, favorite philosopher, Winnie the Pooh. When you are a bear of very little brain and you think of things, you find sometimes that a thing which seemed very thingish inside of you is quite different when it gets out into the open and has other people looking at it. It's all about connection. And next up, we have my colleague, Laura Crowder. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Crowder. I am the Health Promotion Manager at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. I attended the Resilience to Thriving training back in 2018 in the fall. And the reason I wanted to do this was when I was talking to my airmen across all different career fields, 
stress was an underlying factor why they were using tobacco or nicotine products, why they weren't getting good night's sleep, and also why their healthy lasting behavior change really wasn't lasting. And I wanted to do something and give school skills and tools to help these airmen to be healthier and happier and more resilient. And I found this training. What I didn't realize at the time was this training was going to completely change my life as well. And I absolutely am passionate about this work because not only has it completely changed my life, I want to share that with everyone. Um, and I really want to give skill, these skills and tools that Joel has created for everyone and just to show people how to put this into their everyday life. So I'm going to the next slide. How I managed to get traction was I was already embedded in 17 squadrons. I was working with thousands of airmen with just tailored health promotion programming and just incorporated in the resilience to thriving training. Um, the original training as it was, that was 90 minutes. Um, I have had classes that were like 80 six to 150 people. I prefer the smaller, like 15 to 20. And I have tailored it also yeah. because it's been embedded into military profession um, education on my base. And so where you see the adoption, um, adoption to this, it's through a couple of different classes. And this is based on how many minutes I've been given. So sometimes it's 50 minutes, sometimes it's 65, and others is 90. Um, I also use the tools in the Raw Coping Power book and create 30 to 45 minute classes, um, really depending on what those individual airmen need or the squadron itself needs. Um, I have had over... 4,900 people attend my classes from October of 2018 to December of 2023. And I have a lot more in this year, but I haven't counted them. Um, one of the other things that I did to adopt is you get a guide as an example, um, whether it's e using EAP or knowing what your resources are. Um, for my civilians on the installation, we do have EAP that's embedded here. For my active duty members, we have something that's similar that's called a MFLAC. They are licensed counselors, and we also also have our mental health clinic. What I did was I created a resource guide that had based on your six dimensions of wellness, if you had on-base and also off-base resources, because depending on the career field, they may not want to use on-base resources. So it gives them an opportunity to see where they're resilient, where they're coping, maybe where they're thriving, where maybe they need a little bit more tips and help. And this guide has been given out to over 29 thousand people already and it continues to go up i've given it out to my spouses um, on the installation as well and i'm not quite sure how many there are um, but this is how i adapt on the next slide um, i'm going to go through a couple of testimonies so i love tool 29 and raw coping power that was a visualization meditation that really spoke to me and i added that at the very end because it really does everything that we talk about it just to me puts you right in there and so everyone can understand and this one airman when we were talking about stressors and to visualize those stressors and how do i identify them she was literally leaning over and then when we started talking about those healthy lifestyle and the positive belief system and how she can thrive she actually centered back out and it was just really cool to see that visualization. And then afterwards, she um, took that because I gave her a copy. And anytime she was feeling a little bit of stress or overwhelm or feeling like other coping techniques weren't working, she would come back either to me or she'd go and use them, um, that guided visualization herself. And it just helped her to recenter and refocus in a very short amount of time with a really um, intense um, job that she had as an air crew member. I also had an airman who loved the worksheets um, in that workbook with goal setting. And he was looking and he's like, okay, well, I'm resilient in my social wellness, but I really want to improve because I want those meaningful connections. So he focused on that. And then he came back to me about six weeks later and saying, okay, I'm great at that. Can I have the workbook again? I want to make new goals with a different aspect of my life. 
And he ended up PCSing to another base overseas. And he would reach back every couple of months to let me know that he was focusing on each of his dimensions of wellness and was sharing that with his kids and his wife and everybody that he worked with. And it became a ripple effect in sharing like how to make those small lasting changes. And finally, um, using the coaching that resilience to thriving grid that you receive in the class, probably the second or third um, class that I ever taught, it was for frontline supervisors. And this one airman, she, we were going through his stress and she interrupted and there's 25 other people in this class. And she says, I know what my stress is, but there is absolutely nothing that you or anyone else can do to help me with this. And she made me stop and I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do? So I asked her if she would just be open to listen for the rest of the class and that if we would be able to meet on the side um, and go through a coaching session, which she agreed. Um, And what happened was she had just come back from a deployment and it was a really rough deployment for her, but she didn't want to see mental health because she had heard about negative effects of going to see mental health ruins your career. And she still had career expectations and aspirations. So she's like, I don't want to do that. So we went through and kind of figured out what was going on um, with this coaching. And it really did come down to, I can help you with certain things, but you really do need to talk to a professional. I'm a health educator by trade. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a psychologist, which is what she really needed. And I asked her if she needed me to go with her. So She's like, well, I'm not ready to make any commitments. And I said, okay. So I saw her again in a squadron, not very much later. And she looked like a completely different person. And I asked her how she was. And she said, you know what? I listened to you. I went to mental health. They were amazing. I have a whole new outlook on life. I'm able to do a little bit better. This wasn't as terrifying and scary as I thought it was because other people have gone through the exact same thing as me. And being that supervisor afterwards, she was able to change that stigma of going to get help with all of the airmen that she supervised and all of her friends and her peers. So she completely changed and has been such an amazing inspiration. And she comes to my classes. She's still here. So she comes to my classes um, when I have them just to give her testimony and also helping with some of the other leaders, encouraging them to participate as well. On the next slide, there's some of the um, different examples. This was for early on in my teaching of the classes. And then if you continue to scroll um, down for my challenges. So working for an Air Force installation, my population changes and rotates out often. And so there are some people that I can see, and I might see them for six years, which I love those career fields. And others, I only have them for like six months or less. Um, But I've noticed that even though they are a transient population, those that have attended any of my classes get their resources, they reach back out. And so it has definitely been a ripple effect um, throughout the Air Force because somebody has some awesome experience or they view things a little bit different and they know that they can be resilient and they can thrive in any of the things that the Air Force and life throws at them. Um, So although it is one of those things that's a little bit of a challenge, I do flow with it and do what I can. Um, And then finally, for my call to action is for anyone who has not attended this training to do it. Um, It's absolutely amazing. And then incorporate the class materials and the tools from Raw Coping Power into your personal life. And then from there to be authentic and passionate and then also to be open to learn from others. I have learned so much from those that I have facilitated these different classes with. They always have something to teach me. Um, which is amazing. Reach out for support from those that have already attended this training. You'll have all of our contact information. We are here to support you. And then know your local resources. Find out what those are because being able to provide that makes it so much easier um, for if someone needs a little bit of help, who it is that they can go to. Is it free? Is it low cost? Does your insurance pay for it? And then don't be afraid to tweak your material to your audience needs. Um, whether that's 90 minutes traditionally or drop that down into multiple classes or sessions. So that way you're able to spread this wonderful message. 
Um, and with that, I would like to send this off to Julia. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. I am Julia Wilkins. I'm the Senior Health Management Program Specialist at Health New England, which is in Western Massachusetts. And I started my career in the exercise science field. That's what my degree is in. And I've really developed a lot of wellness programs for a variety of environments over the last 15 years. And during those years, I've evolved. And my passion has really become to help foster one's overall whole well-being. So I'm just trained to teach in the areas of exercise, chronic disease, self-management, and as well as the reason we are here today, resilience. On our next slide, I'm going to start with guiding you through Health New England's journey with the Resilience and Thriving Training. So in the fall of 2019, which seems like ages ago, I attended a conference put on by the Worksite Wellness Council of Massachusetts. And I was there with my coworker, Maria, and she saw that the Resilience and Thriving Facilitator course was being offered there. Well, not offered there, but you could sign up at a discount, but you had to sign up there at that conference. And she said, are you interested? I said, sure. As I mentioned, I like to engage in those programs and initiatives that foster one's whole well-being. But I got trained in February. And little did we know that February of 2022, or I'm sorry, February of 2020, put us right in the seat to be ahead of the mental health and resilience need that our associates needed and also the employer groups that we serve needed. So our team often jokes that we use our own Health New England associates as guinea pigs when it comes to wellness programs. So we had our first two-hour virtual class in August of 2020, and we had about 10% of our workforce attend. And when I say our workforce, this is these are health professionals that are taking on the burdens of our members as well as their family and their own personal issues right during the beginning or mid pandemic. And meanwhile, they all still have the heart for serving this community that we're in in Western Massachusetts. We had an amazing response. People loved the course and I'll show you some statistics on the next slide, but we'll stay on this slide for now. Um, and it, it was at this class that we also learned a few things at this first class. Uh, we, we tweaked our survey a little bit where we offered it online versus paper. We had some more open-ended questions so that people could give more feedback, but we kept the questions that you've seen in charts from previous presenters. We also started to distribute the book to each participant. So you see that book in the upper right-hand corner. We gave that book to everyone who signed up as another additional resource. And I always say about this, this book is that I love it. It's not a novel where you have to start it from beginning to end. It's basically you can go in and find what works for you or what speaks to you and read that portion. And then lastly, what we also do from Joel's recommendation is um, ask people to do part of the workbook, maybe the first three questions ahead of time. So they're really already starting to open themselves up to asking these questions about themselves and learning about themselves and also saves us a little bit of time. And then due to this positive response, I, I didn't really want people to learn these tools as, as this happens so often, learn these tools, have this workbook, and then that workbook gets put under the piles on your desk, right? So we started teaching a refresher course and we did that in November of that year. And we've continued to do it for every three months for anyone who has taken the class ever. And that's another reason why we keep distributing the books is so that people have that refresher as well. Then we branched out and started teaching the workshop to our employer groups. And mainly this was municipalities. And then we started to receive requests from other employer groups and even our own internal HR. People have discussed here today the struggle with the time and sometimes um, that struggle with hey, we're giving you a wealth of knowledge and resources. We just want two hours and people saying no. And so we created a 20-minute pre-recorded webinar that people are able to learn just the basics. So what is positive and negative coping? What does that look like? And how do you set goals around stress? And so that was really great for organizations who really could not commit to a one and a half or two hour training or even splitting it up. They were just a little bit still on the fence, but wanted to know more information. And then we were able to create a challenge around that webinar that lives on our public site today. Then in 2022, I was able to teach 
this class actually in person for the first time. So after two years of teaching it and my eyes were open, it was amazing. That class will always hold a special place in my heart, but it was also to our sales team. So not only did this launch our in-person trainings, but it also launched us teaching this to teams. We still offer the class to anyone who wants to attend once or twice a year, but we really have focused on teaching it to teams because we know that the benefit of having a working group understand these concepts helps them to be so much more successful. And then we kept trekking along. By the end of this previous year of 2023, we've taught about 300 people in 13 different employer groups. And our goal moving forward is to implement this training when it comes to uh, employee trainings, new employee trainings, development and management trainings. On the next slide, we have some of our, I'm gonna share some of our success. So this chart right here um, shows some of the success that we had in our first class that I referred to. And as other people have mentioned, we have our questions on the bottom that really are about self-awareness and how people have grown in that area after taking the class. I traditionally don't send the post survey till maybe a week after the class has ended. So people have a chance to start implementing the things that they've learned. And in this first class, everyone grew in every question and, and just knowing that they're growing and understanding and having self-awareness, which is so key that some people don't even realize that they don't have. It just shows this is workshop is so, so empowering. And I will share one story of a woman who attended this initial class and she's attended every refresher since. She said, I have experienced more grief than most people do in a lifetime. Each death affected me differently, but they all caused me depression, anxiety, insomnia, eating disorders, and I started to have to get on medications. My mental health suffered and I was functioning like a robot. I was constantly sad. I knew I had to do something differently because it was just getting worse. When Health New England started offering these trainings, I latched onto them and I love them because it made me realize that I was in a bad place. I checked all the boxes and it made me realize that I had to do something, that I can do things to better myself health-wise and putting them into practice. I began to rewire myself to switch from sad to happy and it was like a caterpillar was becoming a butterfly. Using the tools I had, helped me get better physically, spiritually, and mentally. I'm more present with my children, family, work, and friends. I feel like that success stands alone and speaks for itself, but you can see on the left side of the screen here, all those things that the Resilience and Thriving Training affected this one person in, there's 10 things there. So it, again, this, this class is just so empowering and so impactful. Finally, when it comes to all of these things, you know, we say all these successes and I admire all these people that have spoken about the hundreds and thousands of people that you've taught this class to. So we've had a lot of great success, but it doesn't come without challenges, right? And so um, I really love meeting all the individual people that are part of these classes, but also as a people pleaser, you know, all of us presenting these classes are really have a heart for change and trying to help people. It's really challenging not to want to jump in when someone shares something really vulnerable and you're saying, hey, I can fix that or here's my advice. And it's really hard for me personally not to do that, but to stay quiet, to listen, not try to fix it, but really let the material and the potential referrals that you give these participants work their magic and work for that person. And even with our refreshers, we still continue to struggle with momentum, to keep participants motivated to reach their goals, to keep it at the top of minds of our leaders and our to make it the priority for organizations and to continue to motivate people and empower people. And the lesson to me with these challenges is that we need to listen and listen well. I said, you know, keeping silent is such a challenge for me and it can be so awkward sometimes just keeping silent, but it sometimes encourages the best time of sharing. So that's how we learn more of what people need. Of course, we should look at our survey results and, and what's going on in the community and get that data. But hearing what attendees, teams, and organizations need through this organic conversation really helps us not only make the workshops our own, but make them really, really impactful. 
So I'm going to turn it back over or not back over. I, you know, Laura introduced me. I'm going to introduce Laura, Laura Smith. Thank you. I know we have a pattern going here, right? Julie, Laura, Julia, Laura. All right. So I am Laura Smith and um, I work for Casa Trinity. I'm an assistant supervisor and I'm also a doctoral candidate. Just always throw that out there. I'm working on my dissertation at the current moment on social emotional learning. In my position, I have worked from pre-K all the way up to parents and adults. And this was one piece that I have focused on. So you can head to the next slide. All right. So why have I received this training? Well, um, I received it because my supervisor sent it to me and said, can you please get trained in this? Um, that's how it works at our place. But of course, you say yes, and then you join. But then I realized how nice this could really be. I had a lot of excitement for this. I was trained before COVID. We didn't really get off and going too, too much initially. And then COVID hit and we went nowhere. But then we started this new project that I'm working with Joel with, and we have really gotten it out there. So for outreach, um, to me, actually, it, they've kind of fell in my lap when it came to outreaching. Um, I didn't have to do a whole lot. Um, all of a sudden, people would say, hey, people are looking for this thing. I remember hearing that you did something like this. And then as I guess I do. So the first one was Wayfair. Um, so I did that. It was all across the nation. I've done stuff with CPS and Family Services. My most recent one was the Chamber of Commerce, just a couple little people, but it was great. But my biggest guy is Amira College. I've done work with the staff, with the students, and then I've also done some work with the sports teams. For adaptations, um, I did like switch some slides around a little bit, but the one thing that I did at the end was I made a strategies slide, which literally listed all different strategies to cope with stress. So that way, all the ones people are saying throughout, I will add them in at the end in hopes to have a giant PowerPoint slide and maybe even more. But you know, you hear all these things throughout and if you're not taking notes or you're just listening, you're like, yeah, okay, cool. I can try some of those. Oh wait, what was that one again? Here you go. I got a slide that shows them all for you. Choose the ones that work for the stress you're experiencing. For length, it's anywhere from one and a half to two hours. It just kind of depends on how many people I'm working with and how much discussion occurs. So I did this, ooh, don't this training, yeah, did this training with 164 people, oh, typos, but it was a lot of students, so 82 students, and I've done that within the last year with specifically Amira College. So some success stories, um, this mainly is just what I'm hearing. What am I hearing from people? And I've heard that they just love learning these new strategies, ones they've never thought of, different ideas that they never even considered. And uh, so then I shared some things that some people said, because it just feels so good when you see these in the review. So I believe that this was great. I have been struggling lately, and this really showed me how I can overcome and power through it. That one was powerful for me. Like, whoa, that's great. I'm happy I hit this at a time when you needed it. They like that they learn their own stressors because sometimes it's hard to think of those things. I'll find when I'm going through this training, sometimes that's a difficult piece. And then they learn all those different ways how to deal with them. This next one too, this allowed me more perspective into ways that I can help eliminate stress and cope. And then they threw in thrive. And I loved seeing that because that's what we emphasize is we don't just want to kind of be here. Like I want to show you how you can thrive. So I love that. And the biggest thing, and I see this the most is that they absolutely love that workbook and working through that workbook. I usually send it out beforehand if it's done virtually so they can work on it. But if I'm doing it in person, we are working through it right then and there. So they're having to think about things in the moment. But they seem to really enjoy it. So some challenges. The biggest one is outreach. Um, like I said, for me, I was fortunate. Uh, they just kind of came my way. People just reached out to me. <laughs> so it's like it's opposite. So we struggle with this a lot. And it's mainly you'll reach out. They sound interested. You re-reach out and you hear crickets. So this does sometimes occur. And sometimes you got to find those different people to be the ones that can kind of help with that. And then sometimes, you know, you just got to try again and try again until they do that. And time is the biggest one that you hear. But I have split it up into two sessions. They've been one hour each, and that seems to work fine. They don't really tend to forget like everything from the first session. And you can just do a quick review and then they're like, oh, yes, I remember where we're at. 
And then the next is engagement. This one is a big struggle with working with college students mainly. So when I'm doing this with employees, typically, yeah, they're more than happy to start throwing ideas out there for you and answer your questions. When you're in front of a group of students in a classroom, they just all look at you and say, please just lecture me. So that's the hardest part is when you ask them, hey, what stresses you out? And you hear crickets. It is just the weirdest thing. I'm like, uh, guys, you're literally sitting in a classroom. I can think of one thing stressing you out right now. But then usually once they start going, then you'll get a little bit more. But I do find with those college students, it is very difficult to get them going. And most of them really don't want to engage much. But when I was with the sports teams, I couldn't get them to stop talking. So it's really unique with the different populations. Next slide. Yep. And here we go. So with that being said, my first point here, my insight is to know your population, know who you're working with, and then kind of tailor it to it. Maybe you know, okay, I'm working with students like this. They're probably just going to want me to lecture. I'm not going to ask them to read the slides because I know no one's going to read the slides, right? So adapting it that way with knowing who you're working with. And sometimes you don't get to know your population until you ask that first question. And if you can tell they're a little hesitant, a little nervous, that's when you might be doing a lot of those cues to try to help them out. Or you might just say things yourself. Um, share your own stories and experiences when appropriate. I always get to the one slide with that wonderful little set point. And I say, yeah, I'm like way up here. Oh, and it's because I've done this training a lot. That, that's why I'm here. Uh, so just incorporating that humor, having fun with it and being passionate about it. Because if you're not passionate and not loving what you're teaching, it shows, right? And so then now your group's not going to be interested. So I love this training, love everything about it. Whenever I get to slides, I'm excited about it. I always say, oh, yes, I love this slide. And then they all just like, okay, she's excited. But then they usually get excited too. So seriously, just have fun yourself. And then I will now pass it on. Oh, look, another similar name to Lori. Thank you so much, Laura. Yes, and my name is Lori Krupski. I'm an experiential counselor and I'm representing Best Self today. And I also am partnering with Matthew Smith. So Matt's here with me today. And I do wanna say that we're unique in the sense that we've had the opportunity to provide most um, of our sessions as co-facilitators, which really is a wonderful opportunity, especially when you have two very spirited, talented individuals who really have learned to kind of, you know, complement each other. So I'm gonna hand it over to Matt to get us started. Thank you, Laurie, as you have so many times. We've been doing this together now for a couple of years, and it really has been a joy working together uh, to have a treatment-based uh, organization, working with a prevention organization with those different two different perspectives really, I think, does work very nicely. We have the next slide, please. Why did we get involved in the first place? Well, I, I know that Julie Dostal brought this up in the beginning uh, a little bit ago about uh, how the, the, the programming for adults and New York State Office of Addiction Services and Supports. I'm the Executive Director of Prevention Focus, which is located in Buffalo and services all of Erie County, which is a very diverse, diverse county. Um, but we're funded by the state. And there was this directive that kind of came down to diversify your portfolio in terms of the different things that you were doing, especially in the face of COVID. Most of the organizations in Erie County really focus on working with young kids. Uh, many years ago, the prevention field here really kind of decided that the best return on investment argument was to focus on little kids from kindergarten and into the elementary grades, and maybe you go up into the high schools. And that's pretty much where the prevention programming kind of stopped. It was necessary to move into the adult market, move into the adult workplace. Now, we've always done some of that stuff, but often the adults we were targeting were teachers or parents. And the angle was, OK, how can we make you better at helping kids, not necessarily things that are for yourself? So when we found this program, we were delighted because this is really just about an adult, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what your job is or, or how, how you work. There's probably some element of stress in your life. And you deserve the opportunity to work on that and have your life be much better. So we are delighted to bring that in. Now, we've been working mostly with small other not-for-profits, um, a lot of schools. We do comprehensive programming and prevention focus from kindergarten all the way up. And to add this into uh, to working with the adults that work in those schools is really, really, really great. It's a nice way to make the thing come full circle in terms of our programming and really is a nice give back to the teachers and faculty um, that are working in the school. So that's done very, very well for us. And we've also already mentioned working for Best Self Behavioral Health. 
people in this profession need this kind of bolstering, need this kind of work and help too, and a lot. And so to have them able to do that and do this program again, not just for how well they do their work, but for themselves is a wonderful message. And we've been doing quite a bit of work with those populations as well. Um, we've done this virtually mostly, um, and but we've done a lot of in-person too. And the in-person ones, I would say, are, are, are really a lot of fun. We enjoy the in-persons very, very much, and it's worth the, worth the drive and the trek and the bringing all the stuff uh, to get to, to be with people in person. But it can be effective both ways. And again, so we've worked with counselors, we've worked with, with peers, teachers, administrative staff, and frontline service aides, all these kinds of people in both different formats. Mostly we're doing two hour sessions. Some of our, our, our bigger clients are school districts that uh, put this into their continuing ed requirements uh, for their faculty. And those are usually in two minute, but two, uh, two hour bites. Done quite a bit of 90 minutes as well. And we're about to do a 75 minute version, which uh, we'll see how well that goes. That's coming up soon. Now, what have we learned? Well, um, quite a bit, actually. One thing that we've discovered, I think, by and large, regardless of the kind of company, regardless of the kind of workplace that we're talking about, many of them lack opportunities for their associates to even talk to each other or see each other regularly. Um, overwhelmingly, the participants were very, very grateful to have the opportunity just to meet people that maybe they didn't know well and to get some of their ideas and, and hear and, and hear some of their concerns. Um, during one of the sessions where we do the, uh, the resilience stories, we break them up into separate breakout rooms or, or, or huddle up if you're in person. And the chance to really get to know a little bit something more about someone that, again, you may never have really, really talked to is a tremendous thing uh, for morale and, and making them feel they're belonging to something better and bigger than just themselves. Um, one thing I will give is a word of caution, and we found this especially working with schools, where I think that, you know, with COVID and all the things that have been happening in schools, the stress and the pressure is very, very high. Uh, but you must take care to validate the work-related stress that is very, very real to the participants. I know we had one management uh, team uh, for a school very, very concerned that their, uh, that their staff would see this as kind of a, here's a thing, go fix yourself. Uh, kind of idea without really acknowledging, yeah, you're being asked to do more with less. Yeah, you are under a lot of stress. Yes, these are things that are very, very difficult. And we're trying to work on those. But while we're working on those very real concerns you have, here's some other stuff that you can do with this difficult set of circumstances you've been placed in. And that totally makes the attitude right. It, it takes it away from being adversarial. It takes it away from putting the onus just on the individual to take care of themselves, but as a part of a team. So really make sure you stress that. I think it helps out a lot with the presentation. And um, I will share that this program has gone over very, very well everywhere we've done it. And I think it's been really appreciated with some of the uh, faculties that we've worked with with a lot of our schools. And it actually has paved the way towards other programming that we do. Primarily, we're doing programs at kindergarten all the way up, model programs. And because they liked resilience and thriving so much, they opened the door for us to do other things at Prevention Focus. Thanks, Matt. Yes, yeah, so we had a lot of successes, and at the same time, we, we paid close attention to our challenges. So personally, what stood out is that we did notice, you know, that individuals who had varying levels of mental health concerns tended to perceive resilience differently. And, you know, we, we found that we were constantly listening, being more sensitive, really asking permission, really trying to acknowledge that there may be things that among different groups that may or may not be triggering. So this 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 is something that we tailored and and provided our, our pace changed. We we really tried to connect with them more deep more deeply. And as was stated earlier, our sweet spot, Matt, you'll probably agree with me, was when we had like under 20 people, right? When we really felt like we could connect with them because we have done the full range, you know, where it's been much larger groups and in person or virtual. So that that seemed to be you know, really when we could listen to them and hear them and, and see how they're responding. Because they, fortunately, they were very honest and very upfront. So, um, so yes, that was personally and then organizationally, as Matt described with, you know, really honestly hearing them with, with their, their pressures around downsizing, workforce shortage, you know, really they felt that this was an opportunity for them to be 
very honest and upfront and transparent. So this, we knew about the mistrust, we knew about the struggles and how it was difficult to find joy. So really we appreciated those uplifts and the opportunities just to give them the moments to be with, to have that moment, that space together. So the next slide, please. In terms of our final appreciations, it really is about universal application. That we, the fact that we had counselors, we had teachers, we we really had online as well as in person, really feeling like there was something to kind of just shift a little bit that made it worth it for every audience based on their landscape, based on you know their unique program, and and really sensing overall, just just like was said in earlier sessions, the fact that they really you know, they, they, they were given this time, this gem of space to be able to open up that workbook for the first time. And, and we really chose, we, we adapted it so that it became more and more about the application, more and more about the interaction, more and more about the, you know, getting creative and engaging them through movement, through music, through uh, play, through tapping, shaking, dance, you, you name it. We tried to vary it. And at the end, what we would we put in uh, very commonly is this poem. You know, we Laura, I love that you, Laura Crowder, shared that tool 29 of, of the meditation. We fit that in. And then we also do this poem just to really give them that space to kind of bring it all together and feel they have a moment of presence. So really overall, this, this has been a very valuable experience. Many share that. Any final words, Matt, you want to add? I just find it interesting that, you know, some of the businesses, everybody needs this. That's one of the reasons why I can get behind this so much. There's not a person I could think of that couldn't benefit from spending that hour, hour and a half, two hours doing a program like this the, for the reflection and for the tools you can get afterwards. It's just a very beneficial thing. Unfortunately, the very real stressors that are a lot of are, are time related are, are the, the ones that would cause a business to need this the most are the same ones that cause them to not adopt. So it's really it's how do we how do we handle time? How do we uh, make this a priority? How do we convince more and more businesses that they need to make this investment in their own people and in their front lines? So they can keep them. Because the workforce crisis is what it is, and, and 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 woe to the business that doesn't invest in their people or not have people that feel that they're being invested in or feel that they're being valued, because they'll choose to go do something else. So hopefully more and more people get that message and we can bring this to more and more places. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody and say that we now have time for question and answer. And But before we do, I just want to really highlight the range of experiences that you heard from today. Um, you know, Dan, who had to leave, he works for the Standard Insurance Company. So he's providing this through the disability lens. Uh, Jessica, for, ver for diverse organizations, Jessica is within an organization, a healthcare organization, but is also expanding beyond that and has done a whole set of adaptations and has been working more and more with teams. Julie is working in uh, the Appalachian region with rural and semi-rural organizations and diverse organizations. Laura is at an Air Force base. Uh, Julia Wilkins is also working within a healthcare organization, but is also starting to deliver these to uh, workplaces and businesses. Uh, Laura is working with a uh, focus on higher education uh, in the college there, but has also done Chamber of Commerce. And you just heard that Lori and Matt also work uh, with school districts. So uh, throughout all of this, though, we have had, which has not been highlighted, corporations have been participating as well. Uh, but as Matt and uh, Dan said earlier, it's very difficult to get people to spend time. So with that, I want to say that in a moment, I'll share some upcoming uh, opportunities that you can get trained as well and participate. But I really want to give time for the participants today to ask any questions. I saw that there were some that had come through, but I'll, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and leave it open for any other comments from our facilitators or any questions that came through that we need to focus on on the chat box. Cynthia, was there anything we need to highlight or any comments that we should address? Uh, nothing that jumps out. I know William McPex had a question. And a few people responded to him. Um, anyone else have a question? 
If you have any questions, you can definitely put them in the chat box, but I'd like to take a moment while those are coming through. Anybody want to share something that they heard from another presenter that they'd like to highlight or comment on or praise? While I did, we're... I, there was one more question that I saw zip by in the chat. The chat was kind of active. That's nice. Um, there was one from Alice that said, I'm interested in tools for building resilience with clients and one-to-one -one wellness coaching. Okay. So I'll we, give that to you. Yeah. So we'll contact you. We have a Resilience to Thrive coaching class. I think Lori has participated in that and we're actually done research on that where we do provide this with one-on-one. -on -one. And Laura Crowder also mentioned she, she's been doing coaching as a health and wellness coordinator at the Air Force Base. So you can use these tools for that purpose. And we have uh, presented on that. We have research on that. So we'll make sure to get back in touch with you. And let's, Cynthia, do you want to say anything since Cynthia is also one of our resilience coaches? Sure, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic training. Um, we've delivered it, maybe we've done it five times. Does that sound right? Five cohorts? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's terrific and happy to talk with anyone interested in that uh, about what, what's involved. So send we us your email and we'll get you information. Definitely. There's a question here from Robert. Is there a standard way to measure success of a program? Standard pre post survey. Well, I'll comment. Um, the standard thing that everybody does, as you heard, uh, is they provide a pre and post survey with 10 items, follow up items and so forth. Um, that is the basis. What we highly recommend, and I'm very excited that some people are doing this, and I think it was uh, Julia, does not give the post survey right after, but waits a week and has the ability to do that. Um, we we can say that our standard basic minimal approach is pre and post right after. However, to the point that I just made, if you can wait a week or a month and do a six month follow up, that's always ideal. Uh, but that's our standard within a program evaluation framework. We also conduct clinical trials and um, and some organizations also look at what happens to those people who take the class afterwards. But the standard is that that's the one that we've established. I will share what's coming up soon, unless other uh, presenters have any further comment. You guys are amazing. I can everyone here. I just want to say if I go around the group. So uh, the success that Julie has had has come from what she called and we call capacity building. So a large part of this work is going out into the community, reaching out to people, talking to people, interviewing stakeholders. And we have in our Team Awareness New York project, we have a, a advocate video that if you're interested, we can send to you, which trains people to be advocates for the community. Um, I think Julia Wilkins said something that's very important is how this is an organic conversation. That it's not just about curriculum, death by PowerPoint. And Laura kind of made that point. Laura Smith made that point as well, that you're you're opening it up and you're what are your stressors? Tell me what your stressors are. And then from there, the conversation just takes care of itself. So it's much more of a dialogue or a dialogical approach, not a, uh, you know, PowerPoint driven process. Uh, so I want to comment about that. Uh, Jessica, you know, I would I would love for Jessica to share a little bit more because she has had such incredible success working within a very, very large organization. And I think she hasn't said enough about her ability to uh, I'll just say it. She's a firecracker. <laughs> <laughs> right? Do you want to say why do you think you've been so successful? Wow, it's been a whirlwind. I, I didn't have. Um, the expectation that it would take off the way it did with just getting certified. I thought this is just one way to expand what I do within the organization. One more way to address holistic well-being. Obviously, there's so much stress and burnout in healthcare. I felt there was going to be a need, but it's been overwhelming. It's um, more than half my job now. Uh, this is I, you know, what I do two to four times a week is going to all the different departments across 
the entire organization, which were spread out over uh, six That's hospitals. Terrible. And um, and so it's just, you know, really developed. And I think because it is embraced by senior leadership and supported, that has given everyone permission to take the time to do these. And and the way I promote it is that this is customizable. I want to find out what are the stressors of their department. So, you know, our marketing department has very different stressors than our ED department. <laughs> very different, of course. But they're both going through very stressful events. And they have to learn how to how to deal with those and how to bounce back and, and learn and grow. So, you know, like I've said, just uh, starting this in, in April and kind of dipping my toe into it. And it took uh, a life of its own. But you know, what's happening is that we are, you know, person by person, associate by associate, department by department, becoming a resilient organization. That's, and there's, you know, many more I still need to reach, but but that's, it's, you know, starting from the grassroots effort and building that psychological safety uh, within the organization, letting them know it's okay to share with someone that you're not doing well, that you're exhibiting stress, that you don't know how to deal with it. And, you know, we always promote our, our EAP, which is wonderful you know, internal for us and our associates are able to do eight visits a year for free and anybody in their household as well. And it's completely confidential. You know, that just pairs so well with these uh, resiliency trainings that we're doing. And the fact that it's been presented, I've done this for our whole leadership team, 400 people that I've presented this to. So our leaders have had the exposure to it. And then from there is where those leaders then invite me to come to their specific department. And then the leaders of that department invite me to come to their sub department. And that's just how it's been rolling out. And, and um, I just feel it just made such a difference in how people view stress and, and trying to reduce that stigma um, that is so prevalent in, in mental health. But, you know, mental well-being is just as important as, as physical and emotional, spiritual, and we're a Catholic organization. So, you know, all of that ties in together. And and I think, like, you know, I, I've said before, having that support from the top down is paramount to make this successful. If I didn't have that support, this would really fall flat. I think I, I would just like to add to that. I think, you know, as you hear those folks around the around the screen here who have talked about this, we all kind of have to be aware that, you know, if we're going to be the dog that's chasing the car, we have to know what we do when we catch the car. Um, and so one of the things that happens is we often are able to get in to businesses by being able to do presentations for managers and supervisors. And then once we do the presentation for managers and supervisors, much like what Jessica said, somebody goes, hey, everybody else needs to do this, too. Well, how many employees do you have? 400. OK, we'll work on that. Or how many employees do you have? Well, we have seven satellite offices with 372 people. And so when whenever we do this for leaders and managers, especially for larger organizations, and I know that large is relative. We are we are rural. 400 people in a business is a lot of people in a rural area. And so we have to have a plan of how we're going to do that if we actually catch the car. And to your point, you know, one department saw, felt that it was so important and valuable that the entire staff got trained. You can't pull a whole staff off of an entire department in a hospital. You can't do it. So what I did was I, 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 I sat in a conference room and I did the workshops every hour on the hour for the entire day so that the entire staff filtered through and this, the rest of the staff knew they had to cover those missing people you know, while they were doing the training, but eventually from the course of, I don't even know, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., everybody in that entire department received the training. And then that's how we rolled it out you know, over the course of those three you know, three workshops. Other departments, they, they can, especially if they're leadership, they, they can be pulled away. But when you're looking at your core staff um, in, in healthcare, you, can, you can't pull your, your whole staff off the floor for an hour or so. It's just not possible. So, so I've had to be yeah. really, you know, creative and, and yeah. of how do we distribute this? And often it's, um, I'm there during a standard staff meeting. So instead of them having the staff meeting, they do this resiliency workshop instead. So let me, I want to make a comment here that is, I, I need to capture this moment. This is organic. And it's unlike other approaches for all those who are listening, where a company or an agency purchases a 
product and says, we're going to train people and everyone's going to get this. This is a conversation. This is about culture change. You cannot change a culture with a curriculum. This is designed as an adaptive program and it's a evidence-based program. Program does not mean curriculum. Strategy does not mean program. Conversation doesn't mean strategy. All of that means is that the people you're seeing here are those who have found their heart in being able to have a conversation. And once that starts happening, people start to take interest. So it is top down supports it. Top down supports it, but inside out makes it live. So it's really an inside out process because then it, the contagion starts, the communication starts. And I want to emphasize this point because the mental health crisis cannot be addressed through curriculum. It can be addressed through conversation, being present. And as you heard, Laurie said this, being sensitive and listening. I mean, Jill, everyone said that. You have to listen. So if you're doing this work as a facilitator, your primary, I think, and everyone here, I think, attests to this, your primary competence is a good listener who knows the resources and then you make that referral. And Julia mentioned that. It's like, what are those resources? Laura Crowder mentioned that. She's delivered those resources to 29,000 people, service members and their family. She did not have that when she first started. But because these people started to come to her, right? She had to make sure those resources were available. And they're not just on the Tinker Air Force Base, they're in the community and everywhere else. So that's the other piece of this that we haven't talked about. So I want to just applaud everyone here for their extensive work. We're not all blessed like Jessica to be paid full time to do this internally. <laughs> but, you know, we're moving in that direction. Um, you know, many people are grant funded. Um, so let's hope that by hearing this today, you feel inspired to participate. I'll stop there and other comments because I do want to make sure people also know about upcoming training. Other comments before we move on or questions? I see, is there a resource list? There's differently. Okay, so the resource list, Michael, is adapted locally. So everyone creates their own local resource list uh, for their community because it is a community centric or organizational centric but I'll, I'll ask anyone here want to talk about resource lists or Laura Crowder, if you're here, you can talk about how you assembled your resource list. Sure. Um, and I'm happy to share mine just as an example. Um, but one of the things that we get as Resilience to Thriving facilitators is a example of knowing like what your EAP number and things like that. And it went from there. So I used some of what Joel had started with and then I went around my installation finding out how do you get in contact? Do you need referrals? And I really wanted ones that were not referral based per se. I wanted it where someone could just go in and talk to someone if they needed to. Um, obviously, mental health is a little bit different, um, but I put them on there. So I had my on base resources. Um, and then I started looking into the community and partnering with some of like our Oklahoma City County Health Department, um, reaching out to them what is available in the community, what is free, what is low cost. And then I also did some things that were online because I have a trans am population. They may be physically like stationed at Tinker, but they're TDY for weeks on end at another place in the world, or they're deployed, where can they go to get the help that they need or where can their family members go? And so there is a lot of on base res or online resources as well, but it really is geared towards my military members. I also have for my civilian population, because obviously benefits if you're in, in a uniform versus not what you can have. So I also have a civilian um, so anyone who is a federal civilian employee that happens to work at Tinker Air Force Base, they also have access to this resource guide. So that way they can also handle their stressors and like things that life throws at them. I don't 
work with them as much because my mission is for active duty members, but I really wanted to provide that resource guide so they have those additional resources to help them thrive as well. So I'm happy to share just so you can get an example or an idea of how you could tailor that to your specific organization or community you work in. Other comments? Thanks, Laura. Joel, I think what Michael, and correct me, if Michael, if, if I'm wrong, it sounds like you were really, what we were really looking for was, uh, is there, what kind of cell pieces are there? You know, what kind of pieces are there that demonstrate the effectiveness? Who has taken the course so that you could take it to people you might need to show it to in order to get permission to get started? That's, that's, that's sort of, yes, that's uh, introductory uh, materials that, um, that support the efficacy of the program and maybe some um and and also a list of substantive businesses that have you know that have bought into it and 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 are um thriving as a result of it yeah we we do have uh a, you know one pagers if you will that you get when you get uh trained that say, here's the benefits, here's the outcomes. But uh, Michael, if you want more information, I'm happy to share with you. We have published research papers as well. We have one that we're working on now. So, and and all these testimonials that you heard also. Um, so it's always customized to the uh, um, location to make it as relevant as possible, unless there's someone else who wants to share. Well, I was just going to say I'll I'll follow up with you then. Um, uh, outside of the uh, you know the context of this conversation, and and um, I know that some of my colleagues will be interested in that as well. So, yeah, if you're again, if you do, let, let's talk about it for a second. Context is everything. So, if you're delivering it as a prevention agency versus an organization. If you're in rural versus urban, you see, so it's it really is an adaptive program. So it's not off the shelf. That's what I should have said earlier. You cannot change a culture through an off the shelf program. So it does require, I hope you heard today that people are engaged in this consultative process and that's what you learn. So everyone here already had some of that, but many people here learn more consultative process. Uh, that listening process. So I hope that helps not to put you off, but it is a training. I hope that helps. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, we're excited. Any place, anytime we can disseminate evidence-based programs, right? And as you can see, it always gets adapted. So with that, I'm going to just share some upcoming uh, events. Um, so because this is being recorded, I uh, want to make sure, and then we'll stay on for a little bit uh, more. And I think some of this information is in the uh, chat box. I want to say that we do uh, customized trainings, uh, grant-related trainings. So these are just ongoing public or upcoming public events in the event that uh, you want to get started. But if you're interested in being trained in your organization, community, or agency, we will definitely work with you. So we have an upcoming uh, training with the National Wellness Institute. You can see the link here. And I think Cynthia may have put that in the uh, chat box uh, where you can become a certified facilitator. This is a two, three hour session uh, and it's uh, starting, uh, pre-work starts January 31st. Um, I'm also going to be in April in uh, the Art and Science of Health Promotion Conference, where we're going to be doing a training on multi-level and multicultural resilience, which is one of the trainings that we helped from the beginning team awareness that uh, Julie Dostal has been using and Laura Smith, that's our fundamentals course, our ripple effect course. So it's a higher, it's the resilience program and more. It's got more to it. And that's April 8th in Hilton Head. Um, I'll be next week in Clearwater, Florida, talking about worksite self-care programs for the Health Benefits Conference and Expo. Um, and, you know, these slides for all of these are available. And then we are very excited. Uh, this will be our second time with the Construction Working Minds Conference. This is a full day in person 
Resilience to Thrive Facilitator Certification Training in Kansas City. Uh, and it's it's mostly for people who work in this trades, unions, construction, because of the growing suicide uh, crisis uh, in those organizations. So these are all opportunities, but there are always more. And as I said, we adapt and work with uh, whoever. Um, so I will, I, I will tell the group that uh, I flew Joel in and he trained the EAP and a member of my team to bring them uh, to make them facilitators as well. So that's something he can do to it. You know, if you want to train more within your community or or your organization. And Julie has flown me in. <laughs> in all kinds of weather. Yes. So uh, if there's no other questions or comments, um, it's been really wonderful. But I think it's always good to go around. Anybody want to take us out? Last appreciation, uh, kind of like throwing down the gauntlet to the listeners something. Matt, I know Matt. Go ahead, go ahead, Laura. I was just going to thank everyone for your participation and your presence with us today. Um, and please reach out if you have any questions for any of us. We're happy to support you. Thank you for your generous gift of time. And you've stuck with us for this long. You've come this far. Why not take the leap? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. 